Good evening. I'm glad that you've joined us for our evening study. I'm glad that you could be part of our live stream audience. We want to be a blessing tonight, and I hope uh, many of you were able to tune in this morning. We had a good service. Thank the Lord the weather was held off. We were able to meet and, of course, had some storms this afternoon, but we're glad that we were able to accomplish that and then be back tonight. Certainly hope that in the next couple of weeks we will be uh, starting to move back to normality. We want to get back into service. We're going to aim for uh, the first week of May, but we'll have to keep you informed on that. That would mean that next Sunday would be our last uh, live stream only uh, Sunday morning, which we'll still have our drive-in. And then if we're able to do that the following Sunday, we'll try to meet and take some precautions, uh, spreading people out and m meeting in both buildings. But we'll, we'll give you all the details about that when we see that it's going to definitely uh, take place. So we're just going to watch the conditions and uh, see what happens, but we sure will be anxiously waiting our opportunity to get back together. And then we'll, within the next few weeks, we'll uh, start implementing our Sunday school and that type of thing and just make sure we have a good testimony in the community. I'm frankly not terribly afraid of the uh, disease itself. I don't think it spread greatly in our community, but um, we want to make sure we have a good testimony and that we're not appearing to be any kind of a, a catalyst to it spreading. So we'll try to take good uh, precautions for that. Well, we're glad that we can be together tonight. We are going to share a choir number with you, and then following the choir number, I'll come up and share from the Word of God. I'm going to have you take your Bible tonight and turn over to 1 Samuel chapter 17. You'll find your place in 1 Samuel chapter 17, a very familiar account in the Bible about David and Goliath, one of the most well-known stories uh, in the Bible. Even folks who don't know the Bible know a little about David and Goliath, but I want to share a principle from that tonight. So find your place in 1 Samuel chapter 17. I'm going to have a word of prayer. I'll read a text, and then we'll look at this chapter. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity tonight to be on the live stream and to be sharing your word. Lord, only you know people's hearts. And even tonight, I don't have a connection with their face, but certainly you know each person, know the heart need. We pray that you'd meet it, that the word of God would have free course. There might be someone who would be encouraged tonight, perhaps someone who is confronted with their need for Jesus. We just pray that you accomplish what you need to in Jesus' name. Amen. As I said in 1 Samuel 17, we find the account of the Philistine Goliath, who stands in defiance of the armies of God. 
We know David, of course, a teenage boy, the keeper of the sheep, uh, came to bring his brothers the uh, cheeses and the bread, and uh, at that point heard Goliath, heard his defiance, and stands, of course, against him and defeats him with a sling and a stone. You know the account. But I look down in 1 Samuel 17, and I read this by way of a text when David comes on the scene and hears the uh, uh, giant speak. <clears throat> and it says in verse 27, the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why camest thou and thou hither? With whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down to, that thou mightest see the battle. And David said, What have I now done? Is there not a cause? That is, David's brother is maybe a little taken back as he's hiding in the cave, as he's not willing to stand up against the giant. He's like the rest of the soldiers. He's afraid of this large giant. And when David stands up with courage, no doubt the older brother, taken back a little bit, rebukes his brother and says, why did you come down? What kind of big talk is that? How, what makes you think you could do something about it? And David simply reminds his brother that there's a cause. The cause is the glory of God. The cause is here is a, uh, an uncircumcised Philistine who is defying the armies of the living God, and his heart is stirred. Now, let me remind you that we live in a day where there is much that ought to stir our heart. I mean, we look at our world around us, and we live in the midst of a society that is, that is quickly trying to secularize every aspect of our life. It doesn't take much. You can look at almost any story on the news, and in some state, some football team, uh, some school, some civil organization, some public park, uh, it might be a cemetery for the military, in every aspect... The, the devil is trying to make headway and secularize every aspect of our culture. They don't want the name of Jesus mentioned in the public square. The Bible can't be brought up when uh, we try to meet needs. Uh, people would love to uh, just simply take away any kind of right we have to give the gospel. I mean, there is constant pressure in a government sense to, to overreach and to keep us from getting out the gospel. We constantly see the giant of our society, and we know the devil is behind it, to defy the work of God. So we ask the question today, is there not a cause? Uh, we live in a culture today where, of course, every uh, thing that's holy and right, uh, the, the uh, institution of marriage is being attacked. Whether it be a person even having to question whether or not they're even a male or female, when God made them male and female at the beginning, that's a defiance against God and His creation. When they would pull the rug out from under marriage and redefine it and say two men could be married or two women can be married or a man and a woman can be married and it's all three the same thing, that's an attack on the institution that God has put down. And I say that that is a giant that is standing up that needs to be toppled. Is there not a cause? I mean, if we as believers sit back and do not see that there are some things today that would stir our heart and cause us to stand up and say, we'd better get the gospel to a lost world. Now, we can be politically active. We can certainly be a light, and we can be salt, and we can be socially active, and we can certainly take our stand. Uh, we get thrown in a position. We, got, we get pushed into a corner. If you take a stand against homosexuality, against immorality, against people's debauchery, uh, maybe even against the liquor crowd or whatever it is, oh, well, you're judgmental. Hey, nobody wants folks to be saved any more than a born-again, sold-out Christian. No matter what kind of sins in their life, we want them to be changed. We want them to have the peace that passes all understanding. But as we see the debauchery that's been pushed down our throat and the culture that we live in, uh, we look and we wonder. We say, what is God going to do? Well, he's already doing something. He has put something in our hands, the gospel of Jesus Christ. I asked the question that David asked tonight, is there not a cause? Do we not have something that would burden us, that would stir us, and say, God, uh, the ballot box is great. I want to pray that our leaders would make right decisions, but first and foremost, we've got to take this book, and we've got to put this book in the middle of the devil's uh, uh, arena and, and hinder the work that he's trying to accomplish. There is a cause today. Now, 
The question is, are we, as believers tonight, committed to the cause? When I look at this account, this well-known account in the Bible, and it reminds me, as David said, that there's a cause. Because I've got here this giant, uh, Goliath, who stands here and is, of course, a, a formidable foe. Um, as far as a normal man was concerned, nobody was going to hinder him. So I look at this account and I think, what is going to commit me to the cause just like David was committed to the cause? I mean, we think about giants. We know that this uh, situation that we're in now is insurmountable. We reach some insurmountable things. We go up against what looks like would be insurmountable and that uh, just uh, the laws that are passed and so forth. How would we ever uh, get prayer in the school? Well, we, uh, of course, had prayer in the school at one time, and we need more than just praying to any god. Uh, we need to pray to Jesus, and we need to seek his help. How would we ever accomplish uh, making inroads into our public domain? It's a giant that must be cast down, and it can only happen by God's power. So you know what really stirs me to begin with? What commits my heart to the cause is the battle. I want to notice, first of all, in this passage, as I think about David, <clears throat> think about Goliath, and of course it's familiar, but I want to think about the battle. You know, the first thing I notice here is I notice the supply. Now, I'm going to go back and read, if I can, uh, beginning back in verse 4 of the chapter, and it says, There went out a champion of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. The weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. He had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. The staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spearhead weighed, weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am I not a Philistine and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you, and let him come down. And if he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. You know, here we have a, a giant that from a human standpoint was not going to be defeated. Now the weaponry that they had in the day in which David lived would have been a sword or a spear or a knife or hand-to-hand -hand combat. Now, some people differ on a cubit, but we know a cubit is about 18 inches. And so here's a man that is approximately 10 feet tall. Now, you say, don't you think that was a little exaggerated over the years? I believe that he was 10 feet tall or uh, approximately 10 feet tall, six cubits and a span, as much as I believe I'm standing on the platform. The inerrant word of God is emphasizing the fact that this wasn't just a tall man. He was a giant. He was undefeatable from a physical standpoint. Who's going to do hand-to-hand -hand combat? Now, we know later on there were some men, that David's mighty men, that did some unusual things and had an unusual ability. But who knows that David didn't start off people trusting that God could actually empower you to defeat somebody like this. But here is a man 10 foot tall. Now, he wasn't going up just against a good-sized man. I'm sure many of you that are watching our live stream, you uh, know people in our church, and probably you're familiar with Bill Ashley. Now, Bill Ashley's about, I don't know, 6'5", and at least 150 pounds, and he's a big old man. But, you know, Goliath could have stood up against Bill Ashley, and Bill Ashley would have looked like a little child next to him. I mean, this man was intimidating. But we didn't have Bill Ashley standing up against him. It was David. You see, the issue wasn't how tall David was or how strong he was or how much skill he had. The issue with David is he needed the help of God. And let me tell you, when we look at the calls today, we don't need to look at the size of the enemy. We need to look at the power of the God who's behind us. You know, the Bible tells us in 1 John 4, 4, we know we're in battle against the devil. We know that the devil, of course, is is running everything that's bad. I mean, we don't, we're not bitter against the human beings. We're just all sinners. Happen to be Christians saved by grace. They need to be saved by grace. The devil's the one that we get bitter against, and we look at him, and he's wily. He has certainly uh, got some ability that God has given, allowed him to have, and, and he's powerful and so forth. 
But the Bible says in 1 John 4, 4, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Thanks be unto God that giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 John 5, 4, this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. See, it didn't make any difference that Goliath came out and he had a a, a big spear and his body was intimidating and he was overbearing. The men of Israel looked and said, there's no way that I can physically defeat the giant. David looked at it and said, well, I can't defeat the giant, but God can. So human uh, inferiority, there's no way without God they were going to defeat the giant. But David looked at it. He said, there's something bigger going on, not just the the supply that I need from God, but I look at this account and I think about the stakes. What was at stake here? Now, from a physical standpoint, if Goliath won, he said, if I win, no need for everybody to die. He said, let's have a battle. Instead of a bunch of people getting killed, why don't we just have one man come out and face me? Then that's easy for Goliath to say because he knew there was nobody that was going to have a chance of beating him. He said, just send me one man, and if I kill him, we won't kill everybody. He'll just become our servants. We win. If you, and he chuckled under his breath, are able to defeat me, then we'll be your servants. We find later on, of course, he had no intention of keeping his end of the bargain, but he was defying, and he says it outright, I am defying the armies of Israel. Now, they well knew that the army of Israel was the armies of the Lord Jehovah God. They well believed in that day, even the heathen, that if you won a battle, it's because your God was more powerful than the other God. He is defying the Lord. You look over to verse 23 of this chapter, and David, of course, comes on the scene. And as he talked in verse 23, Behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same word, and David heard them. Now David didn't know about this giant. He just came for another purpose, but when he heard Goliath walk out and said, I defy the armies of the living God today. I dare an Israelite to come out. You worshipers of Jehovah, come show me what you've got. And they went and hid in a cave. David watched a couple of them scurry under a log. He watched two or three of them hide behind a tree. He was about to pass out his cheese to his brothers, and before he could hand it, they just gone. He, what happened? And then he heard Goliath, where are you, Israel? Where is the followers of Jehovah? David's heart was stirred because he knew what was at stake here. Now, I'm sure nobody wanted to to follow the Philistines and be their servant, but much more than that was God's name was at stake. Now, let me remind you today what's at stake for the cause. You know, first of all, what is at stake? Just like the Israelites were going to have to serve the Philistines, Do you realize we have a generation of people without Jesus Christ that are servants of sin? You know, look at people's lives today. People's lives are a mess. There is untold millions of people whose life is destroyed by drugs. They're a slave to their sin. But you know, Jesus said, whoso committed sin is a servant of sin. You know, here's some person who works a job, makes a decent living, maybe even keeps their family together, and it by any means on drugs. They look over at somebody and say, boy, that's terrible. They get off of it, get out of rehab, and before you know it, they're right back at it again. Uh, They might even go to the point of just getting on the side of the road, holding a sign, I will work for food so they can get $10, get another hit of heroin, and you look at their life and say, man, what a mess, what a wreck. And you're right, they are. And yes, they're a slave to their sin, but do you know all committers of sin without Jesus are slaves to their sin? You may be a slave to your pride. You could be a slave to your tongue. You might be a slave to your sexual immorality. You might be a slave to your uh, desire to cheat. Hey, I don't know what it is, but that same sin that'll send that drug addict to hell, your sin that nobody knows about is going to send you to hell without Jesus. There is a cause today, and the cause is the slavery of sin. Hey, I'm glad that through the Lord Jesus Christ, we can be delivered from the slavery of sin. Hey, there was slavery at stake. You know, it was also the fact that when um, Goliath was going to come out and that they didn't fight him, he was going to be pretty formidable to come and start destroying people on the left hand and on the right. Well, you know, sin does that as well, doesn't it? It destroys lives. I mean, everything good 
and precious and honorable that we would love to see take place, sin messes up. You see, there's a great giant today, and that giant is the giant of sin. It is in every heart, and only Jesus can come and take care of it. There was a lot at stake. But let me say that even so, what was really at stake was God's name. God's name was at stake. So it wasn't just the battle that day that got David stirred, but I look at the burden. You know, what burdened his heart? Well, I'm going to read verse 26. When David heard this uh, Israel, uh, Philistine come out, David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine? And taketh away the reproach from Israel. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? You know, I believe David was a little surprised that day. He wasn't a grandstander. He wasn't just coming out trying to make a name for himself. Uh, you might think that he would, but yet we know him from his heart. He generally was, genuinely was surprised when he walked out and heard that Philistine defy the armies of God and he probably thought, boy, I tell you, I don't know who's going to get their sword. I just came to bring some cheese to my brothers, but uh, somebody's bound to go fight. But man, as he looked out across the plain, and here's this uh, big Philistine holding his sword up, I defy the armies of the living God. David looks, at, and he sees a piece of tumbleweed going across the plain and thinking, man, where's everybody at? He can't find an Israelite soldier anywhere. And he says, who in the world is going to go kill this Philistine? Didn't even occur to him at that moment that he might be the one. He just thought, you're soldiers. You got the swords, the armor. What are you waiting on? But he said, if nobody else is going to take him down, then I'll go take him down. You see, he was burdened because of what he heard. You know, he heard something that stirred his heart. You know, when I hear... Uh, I, don't, I can't verify it, so I'm not going to mention the name because I know things can be taken out of context. I heard a well-known politician get up and talking about this virus the other day. I mean, a big name, and it was put on Facebook, so I take it with a grain of salt. I don't uh, believe everything I read on Facebook, but they played the video, and I only heard the short periods. I don't know the context. But this well-known politician who speaks just about every day and talks about his state and what's going on with his virus and so forth. He said, when this virus goes down, God's not going to take it down. We're going to take it down. You know, when I hear somebody defy the name of God, something bubbles up inside of me. I get a little stirred inside, and I says, you know, here, here this man, this heathen, doesn't recognize that God's got to help. He thinks he has all the fate in his own hand and that the people hold all that power I think, God, I sure would like you to show him who you are. I mean, there's a side of me that says, God, I wouldn't mind if you just kind of picked him up by the nap of the neck and maybe cut his air off for two or three seconds and made him realize, but God doesn't work that way. God will show him from another way who he is. I look at Psalm 2, and it says, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? This uh, fellow, uh, idiot that has this talk show, atheist, uh, uh, Mayor, Bill Maher, or something like that. I'd have never watched his show, wouldn't take time to turn it on. But I'll, I'll read a quote or something from the news. And this guy, he loves the grandstand and tell you how much he hates God, hates the Bible, hates Christianity. Listen, God's not intimidated by that. When that heathen rages and that person imagines a vain thing, the Bible says in Psalm 2-4, He that sitteth in the heaven shall laugh. God's not taken back. He's not intimidated. But I'll tell you what it ought to do to God's people. It ought to stir our heart. We ought to say, God, would you do something in that man's heart and save him by the grace of God? And in spite of him, would you let the word of God go out and show a guy like that, even if he doesn't come to Christ, so work in the midst of our society and save people that his voice becomes insignificant, we ought to be stirred that God would do something. You know, when I consider the Hollywood crowd today, I look at the filth and the debauchery and the culture that they're trying to push down our throat. Hey, I ought to be bothered by Hollywood. You know, God's name is at stake. They would love to change this culture, and they've done it. When I see the political climate, you've got some of these folks, and I don't, I mean, if they're wrong, they're wrong. I'm, I don't mind mentioning their name because I read their statements. They're bold. They're, I, I'm, not, I'm not defaming them. You've got somebody like this uh, uh, AOC politician. 
I mean, she's, I've read some of her statements. She has no use for God, the Bible. She made some derogatory statement, statement about Jesus. Well, I'm going to tell you, the very one she made a derogatory statement about, she's going to have to face. Would to God, God would save her, and she'd stand up and give a testimony to the grace of God. Hey, how can we as believers not recognize there's a cause when God's name is at stake? So he, he hears this uh, voice of this uh, giant, and it bothers him. But then you know God's people were also being disdained. You know, I think it didn't bother him. It's one thing for Goliath to get up and, and stand with proud, audacious words. I stand against the armies of Israel today. But I'll tell you what bothered David is that God's people weren't anywhere to be seen. You know, I'm stirred by the wicked world, but I ought to be stirred that God's people are not taking the right kind of stand today. You know, we're not going to help the world out by being like them. Yeah, you're going to be considered weird and different and far out. You're going to be considered outside of the mainstream. You know, if Christian people would take some biblical stands today on cultural issues, it would make a statement to the world. And we're not going to save the world by getting them to turn over a new leaf. But I'll tell you, if we determine, hey, the world can go there uh, the way they're going to go, maybe the world's dress, it's immodest, it's, it's anti-Bible, anti-God. I mean, just basically anything goes when it comes to dress. But if Christians will take a stand and say, we're going to dress modestly, we're going to dress distinctly, that's going to be a testimony to the world. The world's language today. When I was a boy, uh, even lost people didn't talk the way that people talk today. I mean, I've been out in the, uh, hanging out by the store with several old men that would tell dirty jokes and so forth. And they wouldn't use some of the language that women use in public today. I mean, our culture has changed when it comes to the tongue, but it not, ought not change when it comes to the believer's tongue. The Bible tells us that the, uh, the tongue is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. I mean, they might throw out their four-letter words left and right, but we ought to take a high ground when it comes to our words. Hey, what about our, our attitude uh, holding our temper. The world today, I want my way. And they basically grown men and grown women throw temper tantrums. Grown men and grown women, they pout. What about the Christian who's able to take it with grace and approach it properly? The Bible reminds us in 1 Peter 2, 9, you are a chosen generation, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Don't be the one that hides in the cave. Don't be the one that nobody can find when there's a cause. Hey, let's stand up today and take a stand. Yeah, people might look and say, boy, that's strange. That's outside of the mainstream. That's weird. But I'd rather be right with God and weird to the society than the other way around. So uh, David wanted to know where these people were. But when it came down to it, verse 25 and verse 26, he said, here's the real issue. In verse 25, the men of Israel said, have you seen this man? that has come up, surely to defy Israel as he come up, and it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches, will give him his daughter. Now, I don't know if that was good or bad, but anyway, he was going to get his daughter and made his father's house free in Israel. David spake to the man that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? You know, David said, Obviously, you got an opportunity here. Who's going to take him up? And nobody did. Because what stirred David is what will stir all, ever ought to stir every believer. What is the thing that really motivates us? It's not that everybody would be a Baptist. It's not that everybody would just be raised like we were or uh, everybody would be a Southerner or whatever it is. All that's cultural. But I'll tell you what's at stake is the name of the Lord. I mean, God's name ought to stir the heart of any believer. We would that that name, which is above every name, that in the name of Jesus, every knee would bow and every tongue would confess. The Bible says in Psalm 113, verse 2 and 3, Blessed be the name of the Lord. From this time forth and forevermore, from the rising of the sun till the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. Well, of course, David ignited his burden. When he saw the battle, it ignited his burden, and it gave him inescapable boldness you know how the story goes but i'll read it down in verse 45 uh, beginning actually back in verse 39 david girded his sword and of course saul had gone and heard the the uh, david's interested of him. he's just a 16 year old boy but i guess 
Uh, maybe we can distract him, send him out there and let him fight the giant. I don't know what will happen. So David's ready to go. He says, let me at him. And David girds his sword and his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved the armor. David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off. He took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook, put them in a shepherd's bag which he had, even in a scrip, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. The Philistine came on, drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. When the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. The Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? The Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I'll give thy flesh to the fowls of the air, to the beast of the earth. And then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. Now you may be impressed with David's markmanship. You might say, boy, I know the story. David's going to get that sling, and the, he's going to whip that thing around, and whoo, and he's going to put it right in his forehead, right between the eyes, and lay him right on his back. You say, boy, wasn't that a lucky shot? Or maybe you'd go further and say, well, David's out there keeping sheep. Man, he practiced that thing all the time. Well, you know, to kill a 10-foot, probably 500-pound man with a rock, is difficult anyway but David is very clear to tell us he was not counting on his markmanship now he might have been good but he said you come with a sword and with a shield he didn't say I come to you with an accurate weapon no he said I come to you in God's name you know it doesn't really matter today how much ability how much talent uh, how well spoken you are what you need today is the power of God we need God's boldness upon us. Acts 4.31, when the disciples faced with persecution and faced with difficulty, knowing they had a great cause ahead of them, it says in verse 31 of that chapter, when they prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the Word of God with boldness. You know, if we're going to boldly stand up for the cause, we've got to, first of all, just like David, recognize our insufficiency. He came to Saul. And he said, look, I'm willing to take the giant. Saul said, well, you're just a youth. Man, I got some good soldiers out here. What do you think? Well, now David knew in his mind God was going to fight the battle. But he also had to talk Saul into it. He said, well, look, I've had a lion and a bear to come out and attack me, and I took care of it. Now, he didn't tell Saul because Saul wouldn't have understood it. But what David was saying is, I don't have the ability to de 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 defeat a bear, but God does. I don't have the ability to defeat a lion, but God protected me. And he said, just as much, I don't have the ability to beat a giant, but God does. He recognized his insufficiency. He tried to put on the armor. He knew he didn't need armor. Armor wasn't going to help him. Listen, we don't need all types of human means and human extras and help we don't need to take the world's way and say boy if we could take the world's uh, business mind and the world's entertainment and the world's uh, philosophy and try to implement the gospel into it no we don't need the world's anything we just need the power of the gospel we need to go well armed and well trained and prepared with the preparation of the gospel of peace there's a cause the Bible says in John 6, 63, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. Zechariah the prophet yelled out, just like David recognized this principle, it's not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. We need God's power and God's help. His boldness came from God. But you know, he had great faith. And the Bible tells us faith is the victory that overcometh the world. You know, he threw that rock. And by the way, the rock's always a picture of Jesus. He is the foundation. He is the chief cornerstone. Now, we don't, as it were, throw Jesus, but he wielded the rock, and we set forth the Son of God. And I'm going to tell you, the Son of God can take down any giant. There's nothing too big for him. He had faith. He had power. 
We know that the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Listen, there is no politician. There is no outspoken media giant. There is no uh, government entity. There is no country. There is nothing on this earth that is more powerful than the word of God. I mean, this book's been attacked. It's been maligned. There's been efforts to rub it out. There's been efforts to undermine it. I mean, this book was around before you got here and will be here after you're dead. It is the Word of God, inerrant, powerful, and God put it in our hands. You know, he picked up the five smooth stones. He had a sling. He had a rock. But God had to direct it. Well, you know, the Bible is a book that is not my sword. It is the Spirit's sword. The sword of the Spirit. He'll wield the Word of God. He had faith. He had power. And he had foolishness. You know, I'm sure the soldiers were watching that day with anticipation. They're hiding in a cave, by the way. The brother of David's going to criticize him. Why are you even here? Well, he didn't go out and fight the giant. But David went out boldly that day. No armor. No shield. No knife. No sword. But a slingshot. He had that and some rocks. And they're watching the battle. Here's this big 10-foot tall, huge man. Here's this little boy who's coming out there. He's even, uh, I don't even think he had even shaved yet. He's ruddy and a beautiful countenance. And man, this little kid, what's he going to do? And they're watching with anticipation. And don't you know some of them said, David is a fool. He's a fool. Why in the world would he go out there to face that giant? with nothing but a rock to throw at him. Well, you know, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it's the power of God. Even when it was over, the undiscerning might have wondered and said, how in the world did he kill that giant with a rock? And of course, he went and got the sword and chopped his head off to make sure he was dead. But how in the world did he do that? They still didn't understand it. And do you know the world still doesn't understand How a handful of insignificant people who can just simple preach an old-fashioned message about Jesus on the cross and coming out of the grave, we get maligned, we get battled, they try to put us down and they just can't understand it, that the preaching of the cross keeps marching on. And it keeps working because the gospel works. Hey, listen, are you committed today to the cause? You know John Audubon which the Audubon Society was named after, of course, was a bird fanatic. He studied birds. He watched birds, I mean, in a, in a religious manner, in a scientific manner. He would watch their habits and, and make notes about it. And in order to see certain birds, he had to go to obviously some very remote areas of the, of the forest and so forth to watch these birds. One particular bird that had never been photographed. It had been seen, they knew where the habitat was, but it had never been photographed or studied. Audubon was determined he was going to find it. He waded into water up to his neck, sat there for hours, and as he made notes about it, of course he had to write it later, he writes his diary about how it took place. There were water moccasins swimming by his face, but he stayed there. Now, me, I could have shown you how quick I could come out of the water if I'd have been in there, but he sat right there still, snakes going by him, waiting for that bird to land. Now, he sent hours there and finally saw his bird. He saw a bird. I guess he took a picture of it, wrote some notes about it, and I don't even know what the name of the bird was. Don't really care where it lived. I mean, somebody who's into birds might, but I'll give him at least a pat on the back to say he was committed to his cause. Now, I'm not that interested in a bird, but I'll tell you what I am interested in. I'm interested in the name of the Lord today, and I want to be committed. You need to be committed. Our church needs to be committed because there's a great cause, and I pray God would burden us for it. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer tonight. God, thank you for the name of the Lord tonight, for our high tower, for our cause tonight is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Stir us tonight, I pray. Give us a renewed burden that even as we get uh, our Uh, ammunition back in the sense that we're able to meet, we're able to visit, we're able to go after people. I pray that you'd give us a, a great enthusiasm about getting the Word of God to folks that need it. Stir us tonight about the 
holiness in our own life and about a righteous stand in the middle of an evil society. And we pray you'd get the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.